Good morning on this wonderful winter day. I want to welcome everybody here, and I see a few people I do not know. So welcome to our service. We also, uh, as we come this morning, we're continuing our series of looking into encounters, close encounters uh, that people had with Jesus Christ. And those are places where uh, we had talked about how when people would meet Jesus, it would be transformational. They weren't regular encounters. It was always something that changed in those encounters or something revealed about who God was and who we are uh, because of who he is. This morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. That's Matthew 14, 22 to 33. If you want, it'll be up on the screen or you can follow along in your Bible. Uh, it's the NIV I'll be using. It's titled, Jesus Walks on Water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed in uh, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I want to begin by, uh, as an opening illustration, just showing a video uh, called Storms of Life. passage we're looking at this morning, people often uh, approach this, and you might have even heard pastors approach on the uh, the doubt of the passage, that, um, that in that uh, passage, this you have an example of someone who took their eyes off Christ, that Peter uh, is often given a hard time about this passage, but I feel like there's so much more in this passage of scripture that I want to look at this morning. There are four things that I want to 
I want to look at that we learn about who God is and who we are, uh, how God works because of this encounter that is shared with us. First of all, you need to know that this uh, this has happened uh, on the Sea of Galilee. Now, has anyone here ever, raise your hand if you, I mean, there might not be many of you, that have been to Israel. Have you ever been to Israel? Yes, okay. This, then you know that the Sea of Galilee is not a huge body of water, uh, but it's big enough that if you are out in the middle of it, uh, that uh, it can be it could be a daunting thing if a storm suddenly came up upon you. It's about 13 miles long, about seven miles wide, and about two-thirds of Jesus' ministry was went on around the Sea of Galilee in that area. Jesus fed the 5,000 near the sea. I actually was a bit to that place. He cast out demons at the sea. He healed sick by the sea. The Sea of Galilee plays a major role in biblical history. And you, we come upon Jesus uh, within context of some things that have already happened. It had been one of the hardest days uh, in ministry, not only for the disciples, uh, but for Jesus. We know that Jesus, although he was the Son of God, lived and experienced exhaustion, the things, the, uh, the pains that we feel, and uh, he had had... Uh, a, a very difficult day. You see, recently Jesus had, uh, John had been beheaded. Jesus had uh, escaped to be alone, but was followed. He had ministered to the crowd and feeding five, and had fed 5,000, and in his time of grief had still continued on uh, to do his Father's work and to show love to those who came to him. Jesus had then told and commanded his disciples to get into the ship and go out to sea. The reason I began with that video is because of the first point of, of uh, things we can observe in this encounter. First of all, that God works in storms. We're told when evening, when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, a walking on the lake. At that time, the Jews would have divided, uh, uh, divided the night into four watches. The first was from six o'clock in the evening till nine. Uh, the second from nine to twelve. The third was uh, 12 to 3 a.m. So when it says that Jesus went out in the fourth watch, uh, we know that it was sometime between three, probably a little after three, uh, heading on to six. It was probably the darkest part of the night. It was the time just before the day daylight would appear, but still, because at about 3 a.m., it was absolutely dark. Jesus knew probably that he, they were going into a storm. And we're told that the winds picked up and the waves started to buffet the sides of the boat. And this is important because they, we could have seen a scene where Jesus simply walked out to the boat on water. But instead, Jesus comes out at a time where there's already a fear because the boat is being it's described as buffeted. The waves are beating against the boat. And the boat is ro wa uh, rocking back and forth. And it's so dark. You don't have a whole lot of light out in the middle of the water, even if you brought light with you. And the boat and the disciples are feeling the effects of the storm. Jesus, when he sent them to the boat, knew he was sending them for a test of faith. We have a, we have a, a situation where the disciples are in the midst of a storm, and it's, I find this important because if you've been a Christian for any time at all, you probably know that it's often in the storms that God meets us the most clearly. Whether it be the kind of storms of life that are, are loss or challenges, illness, death, that God often moves in those times where we feel betrayed or hurt and God comes alongside that we see him the most clearly. In my own life, there have been times where I would have expected that because of the depth of sorrow and pain that was going on, that God would seem the most distant. And instead, 
in those times, God revealed new aspects of who he was. God tends to work in storms. Sometimes it's described in scripture as refining. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I can remember, uh, many of you already know a bit of my history, and uh, during uh, a particularly diff difficult situation in my life, I can remember going to a worship minister at my first church, going back to tell her what was going on in my life, and, uh, and hearing some incredible advice. At the time, it sounded like terrible advice, uh, but she actually turned to me and she says, she goes, Jody, I've known you always to look for what God is doing. She goes, in the midst of the storm, look for what God is trying to say to you. It seemed like she didn't really understand how difficult things were, but it ended up being the best piece of advice I got from anybody. Scripture tells us to rejoice in difficulty. Jesus describes blessing for many situations that we describe as hardships. There is a reason why. God can often be found more clearly in those situations, in the midst of the storms. That doesn't mean that God creates those situations. It doesn't mean that God sins. But God has an amazing ability to use the difficulties, the trials, the losses of life to make himself known more clearly. In the darkness, his light can often be seen most clearly. That doesn't mean that we always grow closer to God through hardship, but it does mean that we, if we choose to look for him, we can see him clearly, often in those times. So first of all, God works in storms. I think if I was to go around and actually ask people about their situations, if I was to ask you, at what point in your walk did you grow the most in God? Uh, it was probably a mountaintop experience, maybe being at camp, or a time of great trial and loss where you found out that God was bigger than you ever knew before. Usually those are the two places that God moves. But there are other things in this passage which we can learn about, about the disciples and what it means to find God in the storm. Number one, God, God works in storms. Number two, knowing God's voice comes with walking with him. Knowing God's voice comes with walking with him. I want you to, as we look at this passage again, I want you to pay close attention to the question that is asked, uh, and uh, uh, or or what Jesus, how Jesus responded to the fear of the disciples. Verse 26 says, "When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, and their response was to yell, it is a ghost.' They said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, "Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid." I like the fact that Jesus, in this situation, doesn't actually tell them who he is. He just goes, it's me. Who's, if you've been married, okay, who here has been married over 10 years? Raise your hand. Okay, lots and lots of you. Excellent. If you've been married over 10 years, if you spent time even dating for a year or two, you basically, something, a change happens. It comes to the point where when you pick up the phone with a call, if it's the person that you've been married to or been dating, they only have to say like two words and you already know who it is, right? You had this experience? I've even had people I've worked with for years call me years later and I, have, you know, I know thousands of people and they'll start with two words and I'll go, oh, Barb, that's you. Hey, Barb, how are you doing? Not, not seeing the number, just knowing the voice. Jesus treated the disciples as if that's exactly how it works with him. Jesus didn't qualify who he was. He just says, it is I. When Jesus says that in the midst of the storm, there's an assumption that they knew him well enough. They had spent enough time around him that they could recognize him. That just the sound of his voice calling across the water 
was enough for him to simply say, it's me. It's up. It is I. And they knew him because they had spent time in his presence. They had spent time listening to Jesus, talking with him, spent time in relationship with him. He wasn't a figure they just heard about. They, he, they, the Jesus was a person they had actually spent time growing in relationship with. Not only does God work in storms, but we find when we get in the storms, there's one thing that makes a huge difference in, our, in how we experience those storms. You'll find that uh, in funerals. You'll find that in times of crisis in people's lives. If they've spent time growing in relationship with Jesus, then when the storm comes, when everything else is, is uh, chaotic, they, they've learned to recognize Jesus' voice. They can hear God in the storm because they've spent so much time looking for his voice when things were calm. They would, then when things get loud and things get out of control, they already know who he is. It's kind of like being married. You, you might have been married long enough that you can hear a tiny cry from five rooms away of your name. Maybe you left something, that, and you know it's your spouse. Just by that, the start of the sound, because you know their voice. But with God, there's a point of building, deepening relationship where when we, that we immediately not only know to turn to him, but we can hear him uh, because we've spent time with him before. So first of all, God works in storms. Second of all, how we react in storms and how we hear God in storms often is set long before we ever get to the storms in life. It's usually set during the good times and the mountain, uh, mountaintop times. If we are spending time getting to know God and hear his voice, in the times where we really need to hear his voice, we recognize him even in the midst of the storm. Number three, get out of the boat. I want you to picture the scene. I mean, it is dark, and if this storm has come up, it is the middle of the night, and people are exhausted, and there is, there is fear, so much so, that when they see this figure in the distance coming towards them, that immediately the disciples, who we assume are fairly calm guys, believe a ghost is coming to get them. They're terrified. There's a lot of reasons for them to have hesitation. And as we look at verse 28, we have Peter's response. In the midst of the fear, Jesus says, it is I. And Peter is given a hard time. I just want to say, Peter is often talked about as uh, that he, he fails. That in the midst of this, that he takes his eyes off Jesus. Uh, if you read a little farther on, we're going to get there. But I want to say that is not the important thing in this passage. That is, that's important. But there's something even more impressive. In the midst of the fear, in the midst of the storm, Peter does the most incredible thing. Jesus doesn't say, uh, Peter, get out of the boat and come to me. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. In the midst of the, the raging storm and the the waves hitting the boat and the darkness and the fear that everyone's feeling, Peter's response is to say, God, if that is you moving, I want more of it. I want to see, I know, if you can do that, bring me along. Come, Jesus said. Then the most amazing thing we're told happened, Peter got out of the boat, walked onto the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Most people focus on the fact that as he's walking towards Jesus, he, he takes his eyes off of Jesus and starts to focus on a situation and starts to sink. But I want you to, to recognize what's actually happened here. Who in the Bible has walked on water? Hey, two people, right? Jesus and Peter, he is the only other person that got to experience walking on water. We, we give Peter a hard time because he got nervous and took his eyes off of Jesus during that time. But the amazing thing is, he, because he trusted that Jesus was in the storm and that, knew he, that Jesus had absolute power of the storm, he asked Jesus to call him out of the boat and he got out of the boat and stepped onto waves. Now, 
I don't know about you, but stepping on the flat water, that's, you know, I could imagine that. I can imagine keeping my balance, being okay. But stepping onto dark in the darkness, waves that are going up and down, I would normally have consider that a scary thing when I can see everything. But instead, he steps out and he experiences a miracle of God. He experiences God in a way that no one has experienced before in the midst of a crisis, of a storm. In the midst of the storm, he not only heard Jesus speak, but his response was, I see you there, call me up. If that's you, I want to be doing what you're doing in the midst of my of this storm. It's an incredible truth. The people often, when they get in the depth of storms, have the opportunity to have God pull them to do incredible things by his power. When they see God working, people not only can grow, but see God work miracles, and they can actually meet God in those places. Peter was the only other one to walk on water. We always talk about Jesus walking on water, but Peter did it for a little while, I mean, by God's power. And then he took his eyes off of Jesus. Number four, God catches us when we fall. But when, uh, verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. You see, if Peter had never stepped out of the boat, he might never ne not have taken his eyes off Jesus and failed and had that moment of doubt. But if he had never stepped out of the boat, the disciples might never have known what God would actually do in their lives if they trusted him and took that step. Jesus says to him, why did you doubt? But the truth is, he, he first believed, and everyone else had sat in the boat. The important thing also is that when he stepped out, and when he felt like Things were getting out of control and he was losing sight. He called out to Jesus and said, help. And then it says, immediately, Jesus reached down and grabbed him and pulled him back up again. We're told that he walked on water again as they walked back to the boat. God catches us when we fall. If, we take, if there are times in life where God calls us to step out and we're to go into areas uh, that are unknown, it doesn't mean that there won't be trials and there won't be places where we falter and there won't be places that are feel overwhelming. But we have that assurance that Jesus doesn't leave us there, that he always meets us there. And if we call out to him, he, he is there to grab us. The encounter of Peter and Jesus and the disciples teaches us some incredible things. That when God seems farthest away, when the storms are blowing, the winds are blowing and the waves are crashing, that God comes to us and sometimes makes himself known in those times. That if we've spent time building relationship with him, that we, we learn to know his voice. We see that in other places uh, with Elijah when he, he's looking for God's voice and it comes in a whisper. Elijah knew it because... He had learned to hear it when it was louder. So when it was just a whisper, he, had, he could hear God's voice speaking. That if we get out of the boat, if we step beyond what other people are doing, that if we see Jesus working in the midst of storms, that we can experience things that haven't been done before, that haven't been experienced before. You might not know someone who's walked through a, that kind of a storm in your life and seen God do powerful, incredible things and cause incredible growth, but God does those kind of things. Peter reminds us of that. And God catches us. He doesn't leave us in the storm. If we fail later on, he doesn't just drop us and say, oh, well, that's too bad, you doubted. He catches us and lifts us up again and pulls us. I want to pray for us that as we are looking forward to where God is leading us and what God is calling us to in our own lives, that when those storms come, that we recognize that we're not alone in the storm. That God wants us to know him, 
we talk about, I had someone the other day, I, we were talking in the pre-marital counseling about relationship with God and what that means. And for Christians, for, for people who know Jesus Christ, we know that it is not about knowing about God, but it's having a relationship with God. And that's what Jesus desires in our life, so that when storms come, when we're on mountaintops, that we are hearing his voice and seeing him move. And God wants us to be moving out of the boat. It's awfully comfortable in the boat, isn't it? It's great when the storms are going on outside to stay, well, here even, in the boat, and to go, listen, let the storms rage. We're all safe. But God calls us to step out. Trust that he will do incredible things when we step out. And finally, God will work and catch us. God will move, do powerful things, and when we fall, he will pull us up again to continue on that journey. Will you pray with me? Father, we do thank you uh, that in each encounter with you, the people were learning more about who God is. They were learning more about who you were as the Son. They were learning more about the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that there, this is uh, not only something in Scripture that we can see, but we can see uh, just in the testimonies of other people who have known you for years, that storms do come. In fact, at times it seems like more storms come uh, for those who know you than those who might not know you. God, you don't, uh, you don't declare we'll have an easy way of it. But God, in the storms, there is incredible power that you are there in the midst of those storms. Whether it be loss of loved ones, whether it be illness, whether it be strife or trials, but God, you are there. That you walk towards us, towards us and say, it is I, no matter how afraid we are. God, we pray that there would be a part of us that would simply cry out to you, Lord, call me out of where I am. Call me to walk towards you, even though it's in a storm. God, we pray that we would be people who uh, not only walk towards you, but experience miracles. Your power, your under new understandings that you have for 40, 50 years never known who you were in certain ways. And God, you reveal more how incredible you are. God, we pray that we would be people who actually uh, know that uh, when we step towards you, when we're on the path towards where you're calling, that we always secure, even when we fail that you pull us back up. And you do it immediately as we turn to you. We thank you, God, that you are at work in our lives, that you are working here in uh, this area, that you are at work uh, around the world, in our families, in our, uh, in our workplaces, Lord, even amongst our neighbors. God, you have called us to be a light. God, may that be because we walk closely with you, even in the storm. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.